father of 10, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, author of Predictable Revenue with Merlin Tyler, author of From Impossible to Inevitable with Jason Lincoln, author of Income Operating System coming out some point in this year. Hello and welcome to the Practical Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Paul Morton, and we are talking about leadership, management, and the various lives that surround it. It's my joy, delight, and privilege to bring into my studio some of the smartest, wisest people I've been able to find for your delectation and enjoyment. And I hope that you do get a lot out of the conversations that we have here. When you realize that your management team has grown too fast or you've inherited a new team and the fastest, best lever you have for growth and improvement is attached firmly to those managers, get in touch. I help you run management, coaching, and training programs that'll make a big difference really quickly. You can find me at the Practical Leadership Academy website and on all the usual social channels. Aaron Ross, thank you very much indeed for joining me. So that was a, a fairly shorthand, short-changing introduction to somebody with your background. What, when you're talking about yourself, as we all want to do, it's our favourite to watch, at least it's my favourite topic, is what's important that people know about you? You know, my first reaction is like, I have no idea, you know, because there's, like, there's so much stuff. But like you hit some highlights, there's like the, okay, everyone says 10 children. I think it's important to know too, maybe not, but it's interesting, right? They're, first of all, we're not a religious family because that's, at least in the States, most mm-hmm. families are, are religious. That's, that's the, everyone, I don't know if that's 99%, of, but right, not that that's bad, but we're just not. Um, five, or, five of the 10 are adopted, two from my wife's first marriage, three bio kids together. So it's a, it's a, and of the adopted kids, you know, one was adopted as a baby from Florida. One is a four-year-old from China with a, physical challenge two teenagers we adopted 16 who one was rich from china one from east la a uh, eight-year-old from texas all kinds of races all kinds of origins all kinds of ages all kinds of sources so diverse we have a we have a diverse family which is you missed nappies you missed diapers didn't you for some of them, no i went through four diaper stages because we had four bio kids plus one adopted baby and also the four-year-old when we adopted him from china is still because he, um, he has something called arthrogryposis. So he was in nappies for like six months once we got him. Mm. I don't remember, three months. I don't remember exactly. My wife went through a couple X bonus diaper stages because she had two kids before we were married. Uh, and I ne- also, I always used to, they're, they're all my children. I never differentiate other than saying, hey, there's, you know, bio kids and others. And there's not like, I never used to like step this or, uh, but yeah. So we have a lot. Of- yeah, I mean, yeah. you either are the young one. You yeah. Are you yeah. That's it. That was always like my mental, which is like, I'm not trying to differentiate. They're, they're all my children from different sources. And now they're aged seven to 25. So we've, uh, the first child we adopted, I, we got married 13 years ago. Um, and so it's, it, yeah, I went from zero to 10 kids in, well, zero to nine kids in seven, like seven years, mm-hmm. eight years. And then, you know, um, three years later. So it was, it was a very, I hyperscaled, we hyperscaled the family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hyper skills, hyper growth, the hyper growth. Yeah. Yeah. Now I would say that what's important is like that, this, this intense incubator, I don't know, incubator is not the right, for, let's call it a forge, right? Forge of a family, um, which has really been my main priority is inf- affected, driven, motivated so much, so many other things on the business and the work side, the career side and inform that. So they're very related. And as I get older, I'm doing, you know, they're more and more related. So they used to be more separate, but... Hmm? It's a massive constraint. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of people change the way that they live or change the... I mean, you have a heart attack, so all of a sudden you start to get fit, right? Or you lose your job, so then you start to become an entrepreneur and you start, I don't know, Burger King or whatever it was. In your case, you've got uh, seven, eight, nine, ten kids. So, uh, Aaron, yes, darling, get a better job, make more money, buy a bigger house. Yes, darling. Yeah, had a lot of that. But I think that was, you know, if people, you know, if people ask me in the past, like, how did I, you know, create you know, be successful and make a lot of money? Because I made, you know, 10 years, I had to make a lot of money. So I made like eight figures um, income. And, you know, I was motivated because I had kids. So, you know, I'd done a lot, of, you know, I worked at Salesforce and created uh, the new sales system there. and was very successful intellectually, wise, not financially, but, you know, career wise to start at Salesforce when it was a small company. 
Um, and I wrote the book Predictable Revenue about that. I didn't publish that book and I didn't really make a lot of money myself. Yeah, it's the, the Predictable Revenue book until you know, I had married and we had another baby on the way. And I was like, oh, I, I have to like make my, you know, make more money. So I didn't make a lot of money at Salesforce. I started, I mean, there was a small company. Yeah. When I joined, there were 150, 200 people. So, and I joined as a, you know, basically an SDR, like the most entry level job I had. So my equity was tiny. And when I left, I stayed four years and sold a lot of my stock to pay for divorce debt from my fir a first marriage. Um, so, you know, it wasn't when I had kids. So I got married. There was two kids already. They were like four and six or five and seven at that time. And then we had a baby on the way pretty quickly. I was like, I got to publish the book and get a partner and raise prices and consult seriously and nail my niche. Because up to that point, I resisted doing sales consulting because I just didn't want. So kind of that constraint of having a family and having to provide really made me kind of laser focus on what, what did I need to do to make the most money with the uh, most time efficiency? Because mm -hmm. right, I was not, in this episode, I had the constraint of had not only a couple of kids plus a baby on the way, and we had to get a bigger place and so on. And then the other constraint was I was like, I learned years before just working. I had this thing, you know, I'm not gonna, I don't want to work more than 20, 25 hours a week because, you know, I would get th more things done if I worked more hours, but I would just lose sight of kind of like a bigger picture, uh, you know, these bigger ideas like breakthroughs. So it's like, how can I make hundreds, you know, high, mid to high six figures working 20 hours a week to support a family? And I was, a, you know, I wanted to be very active. I was a bit, was, am a very active parent, not just the driving and changing the diapers and making food and um, playing and all the things. Yeah. I mean, you have this lovely little clip. I saw it via the Impossible to Inevitable book. And there's a resource page that comes with the book. And there's a little clip in there on YouTube from you. It's a day in Aaron's life. Yeah. And it's this, this 12, 15 hour day from dawn till dusk. And it's all all childcare, all of it. And yeah. Like a day in your life, if you define yourself by that, that's a good starting point. Yeah. Now, to be fair, now that clip, it is that we had, we had a new baby. We adopted a baby from Florida who whose mother had been on troubled. Mm -hmm. uh, so baby had to go through a detox period, and she wake up six times a night and feed mm -hmm. her milk. And I was my wife was pregnant with another baby. Unplanned. Seven of the seven, only three of our babies were planned which was one biological and two adopted were planned. The rest kind of just happened or came to us. But that day, the clip you're talking about, so yeah, it's probably two, I don't know, two or three or four minutes. And it's just, you know, wake up and breakfast and, you know, dance classes and, and playing and so on until, and at night, it's like, I think it's like 11, 1130. I'm like dancing a baby. And to be fair, like doing this, I probably had like one or two work calls, which are pretty boring. And it probably can't really, I don't know, it's hard to capture. So there, there, there was some work, um, but you know, it was mostly, yeah, just constant running around, exhausting, not fun, but important. Just that's it. Family care. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's it. It's, it's what's important. That was fun. There's a bit of fun. Yeah. I mean, you don't, I find sometimes that the fun comes after. You actually realize that, oh, hang on, that was actually quite fun. Yeah. Well, it wasn't fun at the moment, but it was, it's on reflection. That it's, yeah, that's, that's. Yeah. It's there's joyful. Moment. It's not fun. It's not, it's not happy. It was yeah. joyful. It's different. Well, it's weird. Like one thing that's, I think, important, you know, to me, if I step back, especially having seen the changes in the world and technology the last, I'm 52, and not just the sales world, but just, you know, and I have like a range of kids and I see kind of what they're dealing with. And, you know, my, my belief is that emotional intelligence will be one of the defining, call it a skill, call it whatever you want to call it, like things that you will need to be successful in life, both in order to like make money, but also have a life you enjoy and navigate the complexity and the anxiety and the confusion and the overwhelm. And um, one thing I've learned is that feelings a lot more, to me, I feel like a lot more complicated than and layered than we than I grew up with. If I think about growing up, there's kind of like people are happy or sad and there's love. And when I was younger, I thought my association, if I'm trying to remember, is, you know, if you think, okay, love, does that mean... And like easy and like exciting and like romantic love. Well, now I'm like, no, that's that's not the word. Lo the word love has a lot, has a very different meaning, which would be more like dedication and commitment and an emotional bond through thick or thin, right? Because I've had one of my teenage, one of my teenage sons was like uh, 
crying on the ground with this intense anxiety over, you know, st- whatever that is. And, you know, I can, it's like love is a practice where I'm, I'm practicing. Like I'm not, I don't feel good for a lot of reasons, but I'm practicing loving him. Again, I say we're practicing because I may not feel it, but can get back into the state and like practicing love. Love is a skill, not a feeling. And so going back to this, if I circle back around to this day of so much childcare, of like babies up waking me up at night and playing too, like playing with kids in the in the backyard and sitting at dance class, watching cute moments. And the overall day is exhausting, right? So, you know, having a big family, like the the financial demands, the emotional demands, the physical demands are just talk about being pushed to the wall and past it for a decade, just at my complete limit. And then we can get to burnout later, but just saying, okay, there could be an overall exhaustion or some overall feeling to the day or the year, but it, every, the day is so, is so full of so many different moments of different types, frustration, sadness, joy, play, fun. And it's very easy to miss a lot of the moments because there's the overall like fog of frustration or fog of exhaustion or fog of uncertainty. <laughs> And it's just interesting now, like getting older to try to be like a sommelier. How do you parse out all these different complex moments and flavors and feelings in the in this kind of wine of life? Because they're all there. And they're so easy to miss when you're younger and you're just like, oh, I'm happy or I'm sad or I'm anxious. And you just miss every, so many other things. There's a few things in what you've said there happen. Yeah, you want to unpack. And you said you're 52. I turned 50 this year. And there's a, the idea that as we get to about this point in midlife and you start to look for your second wind almost, it's, well, I've got all this behind me. Oh, I'm just going downhill towards death now. That's it. I'm done. Well, no, what are you, you going to do with this? What do you do with this? And your previous X number of years on this planet has been gathering knowledge, wisdom, and being paid for that knowledge and wisdom. Hopefully. And experience. But now I think what I'm finding is that I'm, I'm almost pivoting to some extent to be rather than I'm still paid for my experience and all, all that sort of stuff, but I'm more finding value and uh, reward in asking good questions rather than coming up with good answers. You know? Yeah, that plus, you know, there's that idea of, um, you know, like when I was younger, I think a lot of young people like, okay, 20s, 30s, just like so focused on like making money career or whatever their version of their, their, or dating or, um, and, you know, I think a lot of people get to the point like I did, or like maybe getting married and so on. And, you know, the way our societies work, at least the States, maybe the UK, probably the UK, cause pretty similar. By the time, you know, people in their forties, you know, could be a bit younger, a bit older. Uh, I think there's this natural time the midlife crisis is a thing because you kind of get to the point of you, at least I was able to see, okay, there's a lot of societal things I carried. And they just, they get too heavy at that point. Uh, and, and my wife, the same thing. And so I think there's a natural time, at least for our societies, because I can't speak to others, where we get to that point of like, okay, the first half of life did tons of things. And now, hmm, what do I actually want to do for me? I've lived a lot for other people. It could be for parents, for children, for a spouse, for partner, friends. And you know, now what do I want to do for myself? Yeah. And I think it's pretty common. It, well, it, it leads, I think it feeds feeds and leads um we talked about the love piece there and recognizing that as kind of a driver and is it the be all and end all well it depends on what sort and as the author c.s lewis he came out and he had the book called four loves and he had the four different sorts of uh, love as is defined by the greeks so you have storge which is the affection it's the fondness it's the familiarity with your your your, your brother your sister and I think you wrote about it actually once in the back of, I think it was impossible and inevitable, the occasions where you find yourself uh, falling into roommateness with your wife mm-hmm. and you realize, whoa, 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 stop, no, no, that's not the relationship you want. What you want is you, that's the other sort of love. That's the eros. That's the romantic love that you need there. And then you have philia, which is the, the friendship one, which is the other set of relationships that we need to, to keep us sane. I think I've always said that friends are there to remind you that you're normal. You know, I get, oh, oh, you know what? It's okay. I'm going through this too. It sucks, but it's fine. And then you have the one I think you alluded to, which is the agape, which is this, the one that's there for despite everything else. It's unchanging. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's the, the, the Christian virtue of divine love. And that's the, sort of the underpinning piece that holds everything else together. Okay, that's when you're talking about going off and finding yourself. You're talking about going off and 
doing what matters to you and yeah, and, being I think also, yeah and loving your family or people close to you regard you know the, the practice i call it practicing the as um regardless of how they're treating you it, it's with the kids you know so i could i could love my wife like lots of my wife or my family can be mean to me or each other by intention or or, or habit omission omission yeah yeah and you know, it's one you know loving them could be the way i feel about them it doesn't mean that i'm like i can allow them to you know this we're thinking about boundaries right? it's, i can love someone and see that they're have a habit or like a, a thing or like a, a it's either the children right when my my eight-year-old's like dad i hate you and it's like i love you you know i love her and i can tell her that and i can i that it doesn't it doesn't bother me yeah for some people it does bother me but it's easier with some kids or some people it's like i just see this as like a like a thing like a habit or a way that they're expressing something they don't know how to express what they're really trying to say so, and not take it personally yeah I think yeah. more challenging when it's, it's somebody who you expect, and maybe that's just a mis a mis of set no. expectation. Like, Where they use ex- yeah, you use the word expect. Yeah, so I I would I would expect, or I assume, you know, I ask out of you and me, I assume that you have greater capabilities of expression of self awareness than you evidently do, and you've just said something quite hurtful to me, and I'm thinking. Actually, do you mean that, or are you just kind of emotionally illiterate? And you talked about emotional intelligence there. And if it's somebody my age, I'm expecting that you you've worked out what life is by this point. And if you haven't, okay, uh, do I have the energy to try and help you discover this or not? Because where are you in this journey, frankly? Yeah, and you know, again, I think I don't know how many people who listen to this would be actively managing teams, younger people, younger generations. Most, I think. Yeah, having families. It's very easy, again, learning through experience. You know, we have a lot of different kids, a lot of different temperaments to be judgmental, yeah. to again, make assumptions, to be frustrated. And we're going to be. But, you know, having the, you can call it empathy or maybe uh, intuition. It's like the understanding, like, the, again, the emotional intelligence of, at least for us, like having so many kids for so long, so many sources. I've, I think I've seen so many, a lot more variety of, states of being and so it gets easier to kind of say okay someone is acting out and to kind of be able to understand them a bit a bit more mm-hmm. try rather than to kind of force them you know assume they should be a certain way and do a certain thing because i want them to it's you know it's like working with them to to come up with you know it could be like in cleaning a room walking a dog right um someone doesn't want to do it and sometimes i might understand okay there's some tasks they don't want to do and they might have a good reason they're sick or they didn't get enough sleep or and some or, or sometimes they just don't want to do it and working out with them to kind of to know at least when is it something just well you just need to do it and when just to lay that just keep it that when to have a, a, a chat about it right when when you just here's the law when to have a chat when to let them to, when to like give them some space um but i think people we love to have simple rules just have them do, you know, do this, whether it's like pros, you know, salespeople or kids and because simplicity feels satisfying. I know yeah. I don't have to figure out this difficult situation. I just have a rule to follow. Rules should be more guidelines. And I think this is going to be the nature of the future rather than like arbitrary rules that, you know, seem to make a lot of company that worked in the past. Just rules are rules. You follow the rules. You know, people are growing up in a bit more complex time. They're going to be more, they're going to challenge the rules. Like, why is this even a rule? And you want to talk about it. And so it's kind of for yourself, it's for, for leaders knowing again when to lay down the law, when to have a chat, when to let someone to do it, and um, kind of looking for the best outcome of the team that way. So I, I feel like it's going to be a bit more, you know, of a complex swim with teams in the future, because then also you have people in person, you have people who are remote. Different. There's just more variety in the future of all kinds. And so simple rules aren't often going to work as well as they used to. And we have to be prepared to have a bit more negotiation over how we work together and how we get to results together and whether that's with your team or whether it's with your superiors or whether it's with customers. Again, going back, and I'm not harping in your age because we're very similar, but I think there's a, an element to that of experience. And as you said, you've experienced lots of different types of kids. And in your 52 years on earth, you've experienced and worked with lots of different types of people. And you can look at certain types of behavior or responses to stimuli and say, ah, that's because, or that could be because. So therefore, 
I'm not going to yell at them and chuck a shoe in their head. I'm actually going to try and work it out. Or as you said, in this case, I'm going to lead in the law. And you make that judgment call. Yeah. The thread, I think, that comes from that to something else that you've, been, you've spoken or written about is, I think, the understanding of cyclicality and rhythms and outcomes in that most stuff you can work out as you go. And one of your points is, you mentioned the non-linear way of living. Now, you wrote a book called Predictable Revenue and From Impossible to Inevitable. Okay, so in the impossibility turned into inevitability. You're creating something out of nothing. You're driving intentionality and deliberateness out of the chaos of life. Mm-hmm. Because, because you know it can be done. Because you know that if you jump in feet first, you'll suss it out. You'll work out. You'll, you'll bob to the top of the fast flowing river and raft your way down into the shallows and paddle to the edge and out you'll come soaking but successful. Yep. How does constraints feed? into that doing what feels right yeah well i do i think that starts through that uh you know a lot of things that worked for me in life whether it was you know starting a business which failed but that led you know this this good news bad news story it's i think it's really from china right uh, i heard it from a kid's podcast but um you know the the, the short answer is uh there's a, a a village right there's a man who lives there with the son and one day a uh, you know a, a wild horse just appears and like oh great we get a fr- you know basically free horse you know the son says that and the old man says good news bad news who can say and the next day the son is riding the horse and he gets he falls off and breaks his arm this is horrible and the father says good news bad news who can say uh, and then the next next week the local warlord came through recruiting basically taking men to go off to war and they left the son because his arm was broken. You know, it's kind of good news, bad news. You can say the whole place like things happen. And, you know, we love to think, oh, this is good news or bad news. But sometimes they just, we don't know where this thing will lead to. And we think we can predict the future, which we can't. It's an illusion. Um, so a lot of, um, you know, going back to like having my business fail led me to join sales. Like I need to learn sales. Okay, I'll get a job at Salesforce. And that led to a great success there. All right. Um, which then led me to leaving Salesforce to kind of, you know, do other things, got married. But a lot of what's led me to do things is something feels right or interesting and I want to do it. And it may, it may, may not make logical sense, right? Starting a business that made sense. Like I want to do it made sense. Um, getting a sales job at Salesforce, so entry level job that actually, if I wanted to do it and it made sense to me because I wanted to learn that skill, but not sense to a lot of people because it went from being CEO of some internet company or we call a young CEO to entry level, uh, you know, sales job. A lot of people, their ego or I didn't let my ego stop me. But, you know, getting married and having three kids, but then adopting and adoptions, let's talk financially, right? adoptions can be $40,000 or a few thousand, depending on the source. And then um, we always had kids or adopted and then made the money work later, right? Did we ever have enough money to kind of like have the next kid or adopt the next kid? No. So it's always like, this feels right. Do we have it for, you know, adopt, we adopted a kid from China who's now, when he's four, now he's 15 or this baby from Florida or older kids. Like, do we have a big enough house? No. Do we need to get a bigger house? Yes. Do we need to pay for the adoption? Yes. Do we have that money? No, but we'll just work it out. Um, so like an example was like literally, uh, you know, 2016, I think it was, we were paying for this, an adoption. And we just, we knew it was really important and we didn't have the money for the last fee. And so we figured, oh, we went and we need $11,000 to like pay this last bit. And we figured out, oh, oh, we could get, we just got $11,000 on the dot by pawning my wife's jewelry, right? To get the cash and like send this last fee off. And so we're always just figuring it, we were always figuring out financially, especially how to like make the family work, whether it was like by making money sometimes, using debt a lot of times, pushing out bills a lot of times. Um, But the family was the most important for us because it felt the most important. So for us, it was not, I'm not saying family is the most important. I'm saying it always felt the most important. Mm -hmm. We made other things work. Even when the, you know, the spreadsheets never worked, the finances never worked on spreadsheets. Um, Logically in our families, like, what the hell are you doing? Like, it makes no sense. You're having another baby, you're adopting another this, or what are you doing? Um, But that was always just what felt right. Or moving to Europe because we moved from uh, Los Angeles to Edinburgh in January 2020, or 
going back to career, you know, I was famous in my niche around sales consulting and made a lot of money doing it. You know, again, like eight figures and, you know, with my books probably drove like 50 million to our, my businesses over since 2011-ish. I made like 10 million out of that, which all went into the family in different forms or, or a house. Um, but I was just like so sick of that business. And, I, and the partner I was in, I couldn't work with him. I was like, I just, I just can't do this anymore. And I'll have to figure out the money, everything separately. I was just, I just, I couldn't go. Now, logically, actually, in that space of out, it was outbound prospecting, outbound training, outbound uh, outsource, outsourcing. Um, I, I knew too that I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it anymore. And I hadn't wanted to do it for a while, but was, I had to make money and that's the easiest way to, but it just got to the point where, um, well, emotionally I was just like done. I couldn't do it. I, I could think too, like, well, there's no way I could keep this going because I don't have the energy or the interest to do another breakthrough book. I'd written a couple books, very proud of them, predictable revenue and the from impossible to inevitable. The CEO. And that, yeah, and it's just there wasn't anything in me or the team to be able to do some sort of breakthrough to get above the noise and to keep the brand growing. And I just didn't want to. So I couldn't work with the you know my partner anymore. I was I just wasn't interested in the whole business and the whole space, and it was, it was boring and exhausting. And I was just done. I just hit the wall. And there's a lot of not just the work itself, but also I was just physically and emotionally wiped out from like having ten years of of like babies and so many young kids. Um, you know, just hit the wall. So again, this whole thing around how you're gonna support the family. I don't know, but I can't do this this thing anymore. So in that case, we negotiated a buyout, which over a few years would give me some money in order to create, create something new. Although after like a year, a little over more than a year, the business was struggling, so we had to stop the payments. So there's just, again, what I found is that even when there's a lot of fear that come up with, because we all want to be safe, you know, I want to have a, you know, have a baby or more babies or adopt and like, but there's not enough money. Do it anyway. We'll figure it out. I have to get, I ha I'm at the point I have to get out of this business. It's not a want to, I guess you have to, I had to, how are we going to pay for things? Uh, we're gonna, we got to figure it out. And there's, there's lots of steps and it's not like it's a simple thing, but it's like following that, what do you call it, intuition or like we need to do something, want to do something and timing can be hard to judge, but it may not make sense. Sometimes it does. A lot of times it doesn't and still doing it. Like that's really the thing I think has been, has paid off both with career, family, happiness, everything for me. One of the things. So you jump in feet first and work it out later. Now, I've got a very good friend of mine who is uh, as free a spirit. He does five stage dancing. He's super wonderful, wonderful guy. And he says, quite surprisingly, given when you see him from the outside, he says that it takes an awful lot of discipline to be a free spirit. It takes an awful lot of work. Now, when you talk about you have this constraint, you don't want to work more than 20, 25 hours. You think, what do you think? Uh, you know, the word, so people, I just have a, Okay, I'm going to be nitpicky because the word discipline. Oh, yeah. Like, you look up the definition of the word discipline. Mm -hmm. Actually, if you do it, I thought I could probably do it right now. You keep telling yeah, me. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah. All right. Um, and I don't know how much this really matters, but I think the word discipline, you just get, but to me, okay. it implies there we go. controlled behavior resulting from disciplinary training, self control, control obtained by enforcing compliance or order, the self control gained by requiring rules or orders be obeyed. And this yeah. is self-control. Yeah, there's a lot of this, that, which I think implies doing things you don't want to do. Mm. Again, there's like the enforcement of rules, mm. um, which I prefer the word I, determination, which it's more around when you know, when you're really determined to do something, you're not forcing yourself to do stuff you don't want to do because it's part of the rules. Like discipline or disciplining, I think to me just has, I think a, pe a lot of people like that word because there's, in the online, people like this idea of there's some punishment or penalty to, to get what you want. You need to, you know, kind of be punished or, you know, be penalized. And people who aren't getting what they want need to be punished more. There's this weird, I don't know, determination, I think, for me, works a lot. I'm very determined in certain things and a few things, right? I'm very determined about creating a family that has strong bonds within itself. And I'm very determined to be, right now, to find work that I really like to do for the sake of the work itself and to make even more money at that. Um, so there is, I get discipline, you know, again, maybe splitting hairs to some extent, but I, just, no, I do I mean, feel words, words are important. Words they are. are important. Yeah. Yeah. So just determination. If I want to get, if I want my, to physically feel good, I'm determined to do that. Yeah. I'll get up 
sometimes earlier, sometimes go to, you know, whatever. I'll do what I want it, need to do, um, which is different than discipline, which, uh, again, to me feels like you're, you're not even doing what you want to do. You're just doing things you're, you know, you're being just, dis- I don't know. It, it doesn't feel as helpful to me mm-hmm. in aligning with like, who you are, what you actually want to do and how you're going to do it. Firmness of purpose and resolve. There we go. Yeah, you know, kind of doing what you need to do and want to, you know, to get doing what you need to do to get what you want, I guess, is yeah, yeah. somewhat bit different. And I think, um, you know, I think the word discipline, too, because there's so much in society and growing up around people need to obey rules that others set. Yeah, yeah. That's where it usually comes from is, I think, more so versus I'm going to set rules that for myself that I'm going to follow. That's my take on it, however. I mean, my take is that discipline is actually self-discipline. It's I, I, I want I don't want to drift. I want to go in a certain direction. And in order for me to go in a certain direction, I have to do things consistently. I have to keep on doing things that will eventually get somewhere I want to go. Yeah. I th- you know, look, I think it's too, like finding some version that feels right to you, that feels helpful. Yeah. Whatever the wordplay is. Yeah, I find it. You know, to me also discipline a bit. Um, yeah, I've lived for quite a while in a space where it feels and sometimes is impossible to have regularity in almost anything. Yeah. There's just constant you know, and constant changes in schedules. Kid gets sick, school starts, school stops, kids are back, uh, doctor's appointment. Oh, you can't only get this, you know, this other appointment. You can only, it's just, it drives me insane sometimes. And there's some periods of some regularity, but you know, so it's almost like discipline for me. I feel like uh, I got to the point where I, I never use that word anyway, but uh, doesn't feel helpful because I kind of feel like I need that along some sort of schedule where it tied to me feels a bit tight, usually tied to some sort of schedule regularity um, versus determination where I'm going to, you know, regardless of what's happening here, I'm going to find some way through. That I think I resonate more with. So yeah. if you're finding some way through, you're, you were burnt out, you're finding, I mean, I use the word burnt out, you didn't, but you were, you're at an end of your previous. Oh yeah, totally. What are you doing now? What is, what is, what are you determined to do now? Because you mean, I don't know. Like helping people write books, you're, you yeah. So the way I describe it is, um, you know, I think it's important. A bit of the story is we have a big family. I've made a lot of money, but we still need to make money. Right? It's huge. It's like the bills are crazy. So it's not like I can afford to not work. For, and it's 20, 2021. So it's been about three years when this, this buyout. So I left my prior business, uh, which was really almost all the money I was making. Consul- most of the money has been through consulting. Uh, so maybe five or ten percent was, you know. Uh, so if it's like over, t- over a bit more than decades, call it like a dozen years. It's called like ten million dollars, and like a, may say rounding up like a million maybe from royalties and maybe a million from speaking and a couple million from like equ- you know equity advisory and like six or something from consulting. S- stuff from consulting or the business, some salary and um. So uh, you know, to see most of that disappear is difficult. But you know, the golden handcuffs. But like I was just dead. I like. It was just physically make me sick thinking about going back to that type of work. I'm actually doing sales consulting in that business and even hands-on consulting, right? Because there's a backstory. So walking away, all right, I'll get a buyout to be a few years to kind of recreate something. Then that stops. So there's been a scramble for a couple of years financially. Um, well, there's always a scramble, but even more so between, again, you know, some projects to come up or some family. So help from, the, from my family, uh, from... Again, like sometimes it's like just not paying bills or debt or, or all kinds of creative sources to get through this period while I figure out like, what do I want to do? But my whole thing is like, I need to find, I know I need to find work. I need to find work that I like to do for the work itself. Yeah. What is that? So I started out with saying, I have no idea what even what I want to do. And I thought about this for years, but I guess just so exhausted and so at the wall, I just had zero space or energy to even think about that beyond like the next, you know, it's always, there's like just so much like the family the bills, the the consulting work. So, you know, it took me some time, but okay, after maybe a few months or a year, I was like, okay, I know now I want to write more. I'm working on new books, speaking. I have actually a lot of speaking this year in Brazil, funny enough. Uh, you know, so writing, speaking. I want to get people together for retreats at some point, probably writing retreats, really around books mm-hmm. at some point. Um, coaching people on business books. I really like that. So there's all these these pieces. It's all around kind of interesting people, sharing and distilling ideas and, and then resharing them through speaking and, and books for the most part. Having said that, 
you know, the family is really important. So there's some blend because I learned so much through the family that gets in, informed into what I want to do and how I write in these ideas. Um, one of the books is called Eat, Shit, and Grow. It's more about this and you know, there's income operating system. But um, so I'm, I'm, I'm making some money, not enough yet, um, but it, I've gotten to the point where in the past, I was like, is there work that I would love? Is that even a thing? And now I'm like, okay, yeah, actually, there's, I can see there's, yes, I will, I have and will find work that I really like to do that I love to do for the sake of the work myself, even if it wasn't getting paid. Okay, can I make as much or more money at that than I used to? Or do I have to trade off? Is there work I love, but I make, don't make much money or better hand I find work that I love and I make as much or more that I used to. And now like, yeah, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do or how I'm going to do it or how long it'll take. But now I'm like, I know it's going to happen. I don't exactly know the details, but kind of, it's going to happen. So that's where I am. Uh, and I do believe there's this weird, sometimes I'll have these knowings. And for years I've felt like, okay, I'll probably found, found some unicorn type co-found some kind of company that's really fast growing. And I don't think that's because they necessarily want to, but I think that's going to happen. It's just a weird thing in life where if you, I don't know if you believe in higher power, I for sure do now at this point, but um, you know, having a big family and so much chaos and uncertainty, there's kind of these times where uh, it's like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen or I don't know this. And other times like, okay, I, I now I have a belief or some feeling I can't quite explain. And I've, I've kind of gone into that zone now of, Things are on there. We've gone through the hardest part around, at least work wise, like not knowing this and leaving the other stuff. And now, now I got clues. Now I got Lego pieces, and it's not together yet. I haven't built the castle or the plane, but I've got all the I've got a lot of the pieces, and it's going to happen. Uh, that's the best way I can explain it. That's where it is. It's like you're, you're you're assembling a whole stack of talent, and you've got a whole stack of talent, and surrounding that is a whole mess of opportunity. And if you've got the talent and the opportunity, then all it takes is time. Yeah, and. I think too a lot of this is this um, this radar, this feeling for like, what do I actually want to do? What do mm-hmm. I like? To, what do I like to do? Because in the past, yeah, I mean, mentally, it wouldn't be that hard to say, you know, okay, let's start a, a SaaS company, some company, and and do that, this, that, and the other. And yeah, they're. It's not saying it's easy, but I don't want to do that. And it, it was, I'll give you an example in this space where um, I really need to find work that I like to do because of the work itself. Writing, you know, writing is a bit tricky because the act of writing. It doesn't always feel good. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, but I like having written. I think this famous people have talked about this a lot. But it, like coaching is an interesting one, book coaching, because I remember I was talking to people about book coaching, book coaching, and I was trading messages on LinkedIn with someone, some people around like their ideas and get feedback. And I'm like, I would I liked it. I was having fun doing it. Right? I really like that. I like meeting with people and talking about ideas. And so I get some energy from that. And I can tell there's like, you know, kind of like certain kinds of sales consulting or other kinds of work or like even online, like social posting. Like, I just don't like, I just don't like that. These are sometimes I might do it because I feel like I have to, but I just don't like it. Um, and I'm like, I need to focus on most of how kind of work do I actually like to do I, what, what, or work I would pay to do. Um, how can I have more of that? And all the stuff that it just it drains me that's not interesting and feels obligatory, not do or get someone else to do it for me. And I'm still sorting through with that. It's like a slow, it's like, you know, I call it the, I call it the labyrinth because this is the basis of a new keynote I'm doing because I can't see past the next turn, which really every day is a different day. I can't see past like today. I don't know where it's going. As long as I make the right turn for today, what feels right. And sometimes I get clues around, like, oh, that is like an interesting thing or I have a talk, I got to put together a new talk. Or, so I'm still like gathering these things, but I don't have... There's no vision for what where, where this is going other than the feelings. So in other words, my goals are not financial goals or this. It's like the feeling. My goal is to really enjoy the work I've got for the most part. Yeah, okay, it's not all going to be points and roses, but to be feeling to like the work and the people I'm working with and to make a lot you know, more money at that than it was before. That's kind of my, that's my goal. And I don't use a spreadsheet that I, and there's not like by three months, I'll do X, Y, and Z. And by 12 months, I'll, no, I don't do any of that shit. Um, Never really did sometimes, but it just never really worked. So yeah, that's I'm just like that's the radar. Is these it's just feelings, really. Well, I think there's a lovely thing that you know a feeling is an emotion, and emotion emotion comes from movari, which is motion to move, right? It moves you, yeah, and, forward. and discerning. So in the keynote, the I, yeah, I went through this, you know, kind of when my 30s was learning, and then 40s was earning, and then I was burning down, and now I'm discerning. So I'm really exploring that I can discern like what kind of versus like jumping in because I totally get I've had my you know my family wife's like you need to get a job and make more money 
And like a lot of the jobs, like, ah, oh, just would like kill me. I, I, that is not going to help maybe in the short term, but I can, ju I just know because of the feelings that is going to short term, maybe make people feel good or like there's activity, but I need to continue. Like, and I get royalties, like, so we have some enough money in to get by and family and so on, just to keep the lights on while get more of the clarity bit by bit discerning what's really going to be this right combination of some new business. Mm. And I can't predict what that is because it hasn't been done before. Okay. No, I'm not going to do some SaaS, you know, this consultant company or something. I, I know I don't want to do all that. It's something new I want to do for myself that I don't know what it is, but I can, I can tell that discerning like that's right, that's wrong. Um, it's slow. It feels slow. Right? This is over years. I don't know if it's six months away or a couple of years. It's, but I've, I've, again, I passed the tipping point of can I do this? Is it possible about all that? But then, oh, yeah, I can do it. It can happen. It's going to happen. Don't know when, don't know how, but yeah, it's happening. And I'm glad like I've, you know, at 52, at 52, it's like that kind of emotional intelligence or experience where if I'd in my 20s or 30s, like I have no clue at it, it, yet at this point. I'd still be freaking out because I need to know kind of like what's the plan and like where are things going and, you know, what's the spreadsheet say and what kind of business is this and yada, yada, yada. And if you and turn and if your 20 year old turned to you and said, I always, I always oh, wow, whoo, you're oh, they do. It's fine. It'll work yeah. out. They do turn to me like that. They're like, I'm like, you know, like, what do, 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 what are your options? Like, what do you really want to do? What do you think is important? Um, okay, the money thing, it's, an, you know, don't make that the most important thing. It's a consideration. We had this, this talk with my 15 year old about college, you know, and like, we don't have right yet a lot of, or any extra money to help. They have like a small college trust, which would pay for not even one year of private school in the States, by the kids from the grandparents. It's enough to kind of get going. And then you know, he's like, if I, if I go to the States, uh, I have to pay, you know, crazy, amounts of money, I have crazy debt. Great. In in the UK, in Scotland, it'd be free. In the UK, it'd be, you know, it's 10,000 pounds a year. In the Europe, so he's like, okay, the financial part, that's, it's important consideration, but it's not the most important thing. What do you want to do? I don't know. Okay, let's think about that. Well, what else is important to you? Do you want to live? Some I don't know. So he has a list of what he doesn't want, which is a, a lot of debt coming out of college. I get that. But what do you want? Doesn't know yet. We got to look at that column too. Same thing if you're like, if you have a job and you need to pay the bills, I feel that. I got 10 kids. I still got to pay their bills. Yeah. So I'm not saying, oh, you want to be an artist, like quit your job and go, go to art school. I'm saying it's to this extent you can. And sometimes you're in a space where you can do this and sometimes you're not. I went through it 10 years-ish where I just couldn't even think about that. But when it starts to feel important, think like, what are the things that are important to you? What do you want to do? How do you want to feel? Or maybe where do you want to go? Um, in addition to the things you don't want. And whatever that looks like, you know, it might be something that happens in a month or maybe maybe 10 years. There's things I've held on to and ideas I've had for like 15 years that aren't ready yet. Um, like expert now, I don't know, just like just stuff. But it's important to think, you know, to start to tap into like, what do you want for yourself? And not judge it too quickly as, oh, it's irresponsible or it's just that the other. Like, oh, what do you want to do? You, again, yeah, I am I want to do puzzle. I, like, I love puzzles. I went to the World Jigsaw Puzzle Championship a couple of years ago, just for fun. Anyone can go, by the way. I'm not that, I'm not special. Does it, and to me, I'm looking at Sudoku puzzles. I'm, is that something, it's like, I'm not attached to whether that's going to make me money or not. Could it? And somehow I might meet someone I mean, who knows. So I think it's important like this have, you know, for anyone, an executive or anyone else, like what are these things that these whispers you have, interests you have, things you want to do, things that feel important or interesting, and to kind of cultivate those and listen to those without shooting them down too quickly, without assuming, oh, if it's not going to happen this month, I can't like, and those were a lot of these things that's working for like having kids and adoptions and writing, um, have led me over over the years to all the things I've got that I feel successful with, which include not just career and money, but mostly family. And you can cultivate these, start earlier, honestly. Like even my 15-year-old, like, like one of his big things this summer, because school and screens squeeze out, so or when you're older, jobs and screens, squeeze out a lot of this. It, 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 it overtakes all your extra energy, your extra thought. So like one of his things this summer, you know, we had the screens mostly away with the kids. Um, and we have a bunch of kids at the house they can play together. And they'll do other things where it's not just like, you know, they'll have other crafts activities. They can do some gaming together. But um, his, I, his big sister, I asked her, hey, can you also, because she's not a parent, 
talk to your brother and help call for, like this summer, like help him come up with like, he's got other interests and hobbies that he's forgotten about because of school and screens. Like help him cultivate that if you can in college. It takes a bit more of, I think, a gentle uh, interest. And I think it's, if you're in a, it's a bit trickier when you're an adult and you're a 45-year-old VP of sales at a SaaS company because maybe hopefully you have maybe a men's group of friends or a women's group or, or whatever that your version is around people who could be supportive. Um, but it's pretty rare to find people who you can talk to who will, I think, be having a helpful way. Oh, you want to travel. You want to do knitting. You want to be a volunteer or someplace. And rather than just saying, oh, yeah, go for your passion, kind of be a bit more thoughtful around, hmm, yeah, how, you know, what does that mean? Or how can you do that? Or, you know, kind of sit with it and not have to do something with it right away. Because a lot of times, for me at least, these things kind of bubble for years. And I'm, I don't need, if I take, if I try to like, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to go to do this stuff with it, it kind of kills it. And I don't have the energy or I feel, oh, I can't do it. You know, either I don't have time, energy, or interest yet, or I do. I don't know, the time, this timing thing is weird. So long story short, I think it's just coming back to for people, a lot of these things going back to like what feels right, but even if it doesn't make sense, a lot of times there are these little whispers or like hints or feelings that are so subtle and quiet and they drowned out by work or school and screens. But those are the things which end up at some point in time, often longer than you think or want, being these incredible sources of interestingness, joy, it could be money or things that are important to your life. That's, that's how it's worked for me. I think the Japanese call it ikagai, which is this yeah. influence of what you want to, what you're good at, what you're passionate about, what society needs, and what you can get paid for. Yeah, well, again, what are you passionate about? I think most people listening to this, and I would have said one time, like, besides family, what are they like, I don't know. No, I have no idea. I don't know. Lots of things. I like flying kites, driving my car, drinking beer, hanging out with my kids. If I can get a job that does all of these, it's great. Kite flying, beer drinking, car drinking, dad. Yeah. Well, yeah. But again, what are you passionate about? Yeah. Again, it's it's not an easy. It's and not. you know what? Yeah. It's by the way, it's fine. Like you don't have to. I think that's the thing in society. Like, oh, if you're not passionate, there's this implied. If you're not passionate about something, then you're missing out, or there's a problem with you. Like, oh, what? Else? You know? Okay. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That's not how it works. And not if you're passionate about work or has to be. Or a lot of people don't have to. You don't have to like your family. A lot of people don't like their families. But you still have to love them. You still you have to love them. Well, there's, there's that different, there's that I got paid love, right? That's there's like, a legal requirement to care for them. But a lot of people don't. There's, look, if you just be honest, a lot of families, a lot of parents don't know how to express love to their kids in the, in the way of a feeling of love where someone feels loved. They don't. Did you, did you grow up with that? If you did, you were lucky. I think most, if you grew up, your parents knew how to express love where you felt cared for and felt loved then you are an exception to the rule. Yeah, yeah. It's a rare thing. It's a rare thing. It's something, it's something that I actively cultivate at home with my children. Yeah, it's a skill, not a feeling, I think. is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a thing. I heard someone say that. I was like, oh, that, that is really insightful. It's mm -hmm. a practice. Yeah, it's something you learn. It's a practice. And it's, a, it's the thing. It's one of the one of the guidance, pieces of guidance if, you're, if your marriage is uh, struggling or if you do feel like roommates is fake it. Pretend. What does somebody who's in love with their wife do? Do that shit. Do it a lot. Get yeah. it repeatedly for weeks and weeks. And guess what will happen? Yep. You are. I think that's a great point. And I would, one story is, you know, there's, I call it, there's like the five years of hell where, because just over this huge family, it's easy to say, oh, like, you know, like in the cost around like time, energy, not time, uh, you know, money, financial, uh, money, energy, physical energy, emotional energy, just mm -hmm. taxed. Um, you know, my wife, especially for different reasons, like five years, just, it was rough. Um, I just did my best and I, and I got better over the years of like acceptance and love and, and not being romantic. Cause again, that was not something I feel like I had the energy for like notes and things, but I just did my best. And at some point it took like five or six years. I mean, we're doing amazing now. So it's, you know, yeah. I don't know. Life is linear. Non-linear to say the least. Yeah. Uh, definitely, yeah, never. Unfortunately. <laughs> It'd be nice to have some linear something sometime. <laughs> Is it true? Yeah. Linear. But, you know, the, it's like, again, it's another reason I believe in a higher power because yeah. and just the, the life, all the coincidences and the way just things happen, doing ayahuasca too. Mm -hmm. um, mm. highly, I wouldn't recommend it. I, and it's something where if you feel like, uh, you hear about something like, oh, that feels like I want to do that, you should do it. And if you feel like, 
You know, it's not for everybody. Uh, the Griffin yeah. call it God instances. There's no yeah. such thing as a coincidence of God instance. Yeah. Uh, oh, I got it. In Hello. Speak of the devils. There we are. My time anyway. All right. I'm going to wrap up with one question, which is yeah. if you can tell the world one thing, I'm going to give you 10,000 billboards. You can write one thing all over the world for one. The whole world is going to know what Aaron said. Um, well, okay. The, my first react, not I would say it's real, but I always think God, life is so weird. Not helpful, but a hel what would be a helpful thing? Life is so weird. That's a pretty good statement. Is it? I don't know. It's it's hard to express though. Actually, how weird it is in a billboard. Life is so weird. But no, um, you know, I don't have the words, but I think the what I would aim for is something a way to try to remind people that uh, people, you know, other people, include especially your family, your friends, but like everyone's different. It's more that practicing acceptance and appreciation and love might be too strong a word for this but like acceptance or appreciation for other people regardless of their differences everyone's just doing their best even when it doesn't look like it to you including you positive intent something maybe like that's it is everyone's doing their best even when it doesn't look like it including yourself we'll take that Aaron ross thank you very much indeed for joining me. and that's a wrap I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for joining me. If there's ever anything I can do to help you on your journey, then do please reach out. You can find me on LinkedIn and all the usual sources. Do please subscribe, leave me your five-star review, and most importantly, get in touch with your comments and feedback. It's really how I grow, and that's what I'm doing this for. Thanks again.